All right, so today I wanted to start off, um, unfortunately we have the threat of a new invasive that's going to impact possibly vineyards, small fruits, and tree fruits. So I wanted to let you guys know about that one. And then I'm going to focus today on uh, arthropod pests of strawberries, going through real quickly some common ones that, we, that are typically not a major problem. And then also um, some that I do see we have more significant problems with. And this is particularly in matted row um, production systems. So our new potential invasive is the spotted lanternfly. This is uh, similar, it would be most similar to something like uh, one of the leaf hoppers, tree hoppers that you might see in your field, except for this is a bit larger. It's about two inches long and about half an inch wide. I'm going to pass some around for you um, so that you can see. Typically the wings are going to be folded back over it kind of like a moth. has these polka dots on the front, um, kind of a grayish color on the adult. It does feed with piercing sucking mouth parts, so it puts, it, puts its mouth parts into the, the plant and sucks out the plant juices. The nymphs, um, again, are a little bit more sizable than your average hopper for our area. They start off uh, pretty, pretty solidly black with some white spots, and as they get older, more and more white spots appear till their last nymphal instar, where they are red, black, and white. So very visible uh, nymphs. Um, and so I'm going to pass around here. This has actually been spread open. So underneath this forewing, there's a hindwing. That hindwing has red markings on it. So when it flies, you might see some red. Uh, but a lot of times when you're going to see it out there, it's going to have more of a grayish appearance because that's hidden. Um, so I'll pass around some adults. And then I also have some cards with some of the pictures of the different life stages and some more. Um, pinned specimens. But so really familiar your eyes yourself with what these guys look like. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about them as well. So the spotted lanternfly lays its eggs in groups of 30 to 50 eggs, lines them up in a row, usually on smooth surfaces. And I'll get to work, uh, more about that in a little bit. It then makes a waxy secretion that it smears over most of the eggs. Sometimes a few eggs are kind of out loose. You can see a few on the corner here that are loose. Um, but it makes a waxy secretion. It looks like someone smeared mud on the tree. But as the season progresses, that dries out and cracks. So that blends in pretty well and is a good protection for those eggs. They have one generation per year. The females will go in the fall, the late fall, typically around October in, our, in Pennsylvania. And that's when they're laying the eggs. So then the eggs are the overwintering stage. So right now, if you were to go looking for them, the egg masses are, on, are what you would be looking for. In the spring, typically around May, that's when the nymphs start to hatch. They reach the larger nymphal stage towards the end of July. And then we have the adults emerging late July, early August. In terms of their hosts, Tree of Heaven is their preferred host. We think it might be the only host that they can successfully reproduce on. However, they can feed on a lot of woody plants. They feed on, on over 70 food plants. This includes grapes, apples, peaches, blueberries, and other stone fruits. Here you can see in Pennsylvania, there's one of the adults next to some apples and some adults underneath an apple tree. This is a video so you can get a sense of what they look like on grapes. Um, so here you can see those adults. This is a huge cluster of adults moving through the grape cluster. And I want you to focus your attention here because you're going to see something else that's relevant about this guy. You see that? Yeah. So that is their honeydew. They're shooting out the extra liquid that they don't need. They filter out the sugars and they shoot it out. So it's an, a sticky solution. And what that means is that when they're feeding on trees, they leave a big pile of honeydew underneath them. Sooty mold and other molds will grow on these trees. And also where they're feeding on the, the, the tree and making a wound, the tree will leak sap. So in addition to that, you have the tree sap leaking down the tree. So you have both the, the sticky honeydew, which you can also see sticking on the leaves here, as well as the sap that's leaking out of the tree. This sticky situation attracts a lot of insects that like sticky things. So you'll find ants 
wasps, bees will be attracted to big groups of these. Um, so here you can see a wasp flying away from two adult spotted lanternflies. Why am I worried about them coming to Maryland? They first were found in Pennsylvania around Berks County in 2014. 2017, we saw them in northern Delaware. It's just been confirmed in Winchester County of Virginia that we have also got a reproducing population there. So we are surrounded on three sides by populations of these insects um, and we really want to keep an eye out for them. In terms of where you would want to be looking for them, again, Tree of Heaven is their favorite host. Um, during the dusk and the nighttime, they'll move around crawling up and down the tree trunk. Uh, but during the daytime, they kind of hunker down more and you're going to tend to find them at the base of the plant. So the base of the tree and here you can see some, a cluster of nymphs at the base of a tree. In terms of the egg masses, they're laid on smooth surfaces, so they like smooth bark, woody plants, but they will also lay on barrels, stones, T-bars, any kind of smooth surface they can find, and we actually think this is probably how they've been moving around if the egg masses are on something that's been shipped back and forth. Um, so right now, again, this time of year, egg masses is what you would want to look for. Starting May, you can start to see nymphs. We need you to report finds as soon as possible. If you do see anything that looks suspicious, please contact the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Their phone number is up here. You can also email them at don'tbug.md at maryland.gov. If you search MDA, they have a nice page on spotted, spotted lanternfly with their contact information in terms of entering, um, inserting that information for the pests. I've also put a handout of Pennsylvania Departments of Agriculture's pest alert. Um, it does on the back have an area where you can turn in fines to Pennsylvania, um, but also it's a good, it's got a good kind of take home color pictures if you want to know what these guys look like. They're out on the table out there and I have a few up here as well. Um, we really want to catch them before they're this in Maryland, um, so please keep an eye out for that. It, it could um, have some, some real economic problems for us if, if we get them established here. If you'd like some more information, because unfortunately Pennsylvania was the epicenter, the Pennsylvania Department of Ag has a nice website um, at agriculture.pa.gov talking about the spotted lanternfly. Moving on to some strawberry pests, I'm going to talk about um, strawberries really get arthropod pests that attack their leaves, stems, and branches, as well as pests that attack their fruit and flowers. Starting with the leaves, stems, and branches, one of the common ones that we see in our area is the potato leafhopper. This guy usually comes out around in midsummer, midseason. Um, they're moving up from the south. This is similar, but much, much, much smaller than the spotted lantern fly. This is a strawberry leaf here. You can see the little nymph. These guys hop. You may have seen them moving. They, they hop pretty well. Um, narrow green insects. Because they're feeding, again, they're sucking out plant juices from the leaf. What you typically notice first is this cupping of the leaf, this hopper burn, where the leaves are drying out because they're sucking out that, the, that moisture. Um, so this is hardest on young plants, and it's really important to make sure that plants um, that are being fed on get enough water and nutrients, um, and they can be pr pretty resistant to, to potato leaf hoppers if they are getting enough water and nutrients. Um, they're somewhat difficult to control. There's not really any cultural methods. If you do get a high enough population that you need to control them, uh, systemic insecticides, because they're feeding on those juices, work best. Things um, like a sale will work well to control potato leaf hoppers. Another one um, that feeds on the foliage is the two-spotted spider mite. These guys also will feed directly on the leaf, but rather than just sucking out the juices, they actually suck out all the contents of the cell which is why you usually see these polka dots where they've sucked out the chlorophyll. Um, you, one of the first things that you typically notice with spider mites is that the leaves start to get a dusty appearance. This is because they actually leave this webbing behind. So that webbing starts to collect dirt and debris and that's kind of how you f often first notice that you have a spider mite problem. And these little things there, that's the spider mites. They're very, very small um, and here's what they look like if you really zoom in on them. We typically see spider mites if we've had an extended hot dry weather 
a period of ex with extended hot dry weather and they can reproduce very quickly. Uh, in terms of control, we have um, quite a few options that work for spider mites. Horticultural oils are one of the things that do, do work for spider mites as well as you can release predatory mites that actually, as long as you get before the population is huge, work very well for spider mites. Uh, in terms of chemical controls, if you want to control spider mites, I recommend using specific miticides rather than using some of the insecticides that say that they can also uh, hit spider mites um, because those tend to, to have other consequences and the miticides work better. Moving on to pests of fruits or flowers. Another one that we see in the early season is the strawberry clipper. And this is the adult beetle here. What she does is she finds a nice strawberry flower. She lay, cuts it off at the stem and then lays her egg inside. And then this larva has a nice place to grow up. Um, so what we typically see are these wilted flower heads because of, what she, because of that clipping behavior. Um, typically we do not see very high populations of these. These are happening in the early spring. The flowers uh, and the plants can usually compensate by making more flowers. So typically this is not an economic problem uh, and it's not necessarily something that you need to control in our area. Um, one thing to remember about strawberry clipper is that it will also feed on brambles. <coughs> the tarnished plant bug is a little bit later season than the strawberry clipper, but it also likes to feed on both flowers and fruit. This is the tarnished plant bug up here. It also has those piercing sucking mouth parts where it's stabbing into the plant but it likes to feed on seeds and developing tissues. Um, so when it's feeding on the seeds, it actually kills the tissue around the seed. So you end up with the, the strawberry not developing normally and it causes that misshapen fruit. This can be confused with pollination issues, but the difference between a pollination issue and a ligus bug feeding is that with pollination issues, if you look at the sizes of the seeds, you're gonna have small seeds that weren't pollinated and big seeds that were. Whereas with a ligus bug, when they, kill the seed, when they kill the tissue, you have all the same size seed, just closer together. The other thing is that ligus bugs tend to happen later in the season. So if you're having problems really early in the season with this misshapen fruit, it's usually pollination issues and not ligus bugs. In terms of control for ligus bugs, the pyrethroids work pretty well. Things like Brigade and Danitol. So now I'd like to spend a little bit more time with some pests that I see more commonly um, in our area. In particular, I see this problem in matted row strawberries, which really favor slugs and sap beetles. So this is a video of a slug, a large slug, feeding on a strawberry, because many of you might not have actually seen this in person, because you may notice it's happening at night. So a lot of times, slugs are coming out at night and feeding on our strawberries Typically, they're not quite as large as this one. Maybe they haven't eaten quite as much of the strawberry. Um, <laughs> but um, you may notice, so you can see that the mouth parts here, they're rasping back and forth. So they have this little scratchy mouth part and they make a hole by slowly scraping away the plant tissue. The other thing you may notice, again, they're out at nighttime. They're really kind of soft and wet. They really, really need moisture. That's one of the reasons that they come out at nighttime. Um, and they will leave a slimy trail from where they're moving. Um, so when you're, one thing to keep in mind about slugs, again, is that they need that moisture. In terms of the, the slug life cycle, many people don't know, we have multiple species of slugs in our area, and they don't have a synchronized life cycle. So unlike what I say with the, with the spotted lanternfly, typically it's laying eggs in October, Slugs do whatever they want all year round. They're, then we have different size slugs in different parts of their life stage throughout the year. Um, in terms of reproduction, they typically lay clusters of 20 to 80 eggs. These are again very moisture sensitive, just like the slugs. They lay them in cracks and crevices in the soil. You may have noticed they're really soft. They're not capable of digging, so they need natural cracks and crevices and moist areas that they crawl into to place their eggs. And the eggs are about an eighth to a quarter of an inch, so very small eggs. They're both male and female, they're hermaphroditic, although they do usually reproduce with other individuals. So they'll reproduce and then they'll both go off and lay eggs. 
Um, so this is one of the reasons that we can have a lot of slugs happen, is basically any slug out there can lay, be laying eggs. And all of the life stages may overwinter. This is somewhat species dependent, but again, we have lots of different species. But the other thing that matters is the, the weather in the winter. So if we have a mild winter, there's a lot of them that can overwinter as really large individuals, and then they're going to come into spring very large. They typically have multiple year life cycles, so they can live for two years and get quite big. They do prefer cool, wet springs, and we particularly see problems if a cool, wet spring is following a mild winter. The other thing about slugs is they eat basically everything. Um, so here you can see they're eating an earthworm. Anything they can scrape, they're going to feed on. Um, and one of the reasons that we see them in strawberries is because the straw mulch provides a really nice moist shelter and a good place to overwinter. So those larger slugs have an easier time overwintering underneath that straw mulch than they might in some other places. In terms of the damage that they cause to strawberries, remember I mentioned that scraping mouth part? You can really see the way that they feed on leaves because they, when they're scraping away the surface, sometimes they don't get it all and that's where you see that white kind of shim silvery color where the, the, some of the leaf tissue is left. Within the strawberry, because the flesh is soft, you usually see these smooth edged holes where they've scraped and scraped in one place. Um, and they also seem to like to feed underneath the calyx. Probably it gives them a nice moist shelter while they're feeding. So you'll see that these kind of slug damage there. So it dam they directly damage both ripe fruit as well as the leaves. Really the fruit damage is the only thing that we need to worry about. Typically they don't cause enough damage to leaves to be a problem. But it is a good thing to know that they're present if you see this damage. Uh, the other thing that they do is they provide entry points for both other direct strawberry pests. So both earwigs and sap beetles can be direct pests of strawberries and cause their own holes, but they'll also colonize slug holes. And one of the only ways that you can tell that slugs were the, the first problem was if you find those slime trails near your plants or on the fruit. The other way that you can know you are having problems with slugs is if you go out and monitor for slugs. As I mentioned, they're only active at night. So one option is to go out and visually inspect at night, get your headlamp on, take a look at what's going on out there in the planting at night. This is particularly effective if you go after a rain event so that it's moist out there, then they're going to be really active. The other thing you can do is you can put out shelter traps, even just a one foot by one foot shingle, um, like this is roofing material, can be used, um, put a rock on it or something to hold it down, leave it out there for a few days, and it provides shelter for them so they'll crawl underneath it. You can go flip it over and see the slugs underneath. In terms of once you just uh, realize that you have a slug problem, some things that you can do for slug management um, in terms of cultural controls is if you can remove debris in nearby shelter. Again, in Matted Row, this is hard. Um, particularly things like tall weeds, wood piles, compost piles, anything like that provides them a place to go during the daytime and then they can come back to your field. So the further away those things are from your field, the better. Um, the other thing is to make sure that your irrigation is adequate but not excessive. The more moisture you have out in the field, the better the slugs will do. Um, so you don't want to be growing mushrooms in your straw mulch. You want it to just be enough to be growing strawberries. In terms of biological control, there are a lot of natural enemies out there that do feed on slugs. One of our best ones is actually carabid beetles. These are ground beetles. They're really fast and they run and some of them exclusively feed on slugs. So they do a really nice job. But actually a lot of things feed on slugs. Even snakes will eat slugs. Um, so there are a lot of things out there that feed on slugs. But one of the reasons I spend so much time telling you how to look for slugs is because the only chemical control options that work for slugs are slug baits. So if you think that you have an insect problem, you need to use an insecticide. But if it's really a slug problem, that insecticide will not work and it won't get, knock your problem back. Yeah. Salt could, salt could help a little bit. You gotta be careful with salt. The plants don't like salt either. Um, <laughs> in terms of slug baits, the active ingredients metaldehyde or iron phosphate, both of those work pretty well for slugs. Deadline is typically the metaldehyde product that's uh, available. Um, 
In Slogo, the iron phosphate is OMRI approved, so you can use it in organic production. You want to apply these baits in early evening while slugs are active because they need to go out and eat it. Um, and then they're also less effective under rainy conditions. Metaldehyde is actually, it works by drying the slug out. So if it's moist outside, then they don't dry out very fast and it's not very effective. The other thing with these baits, and again, another reason why you want to apply them in early evening, is they're not per necessarily very persistent in the fields. So if it rains, they'll wash away. Um, so getting them out there right when the slugs are active and providing them for the slugs to feed on right by your plants um, will be the most effective. If you would like some more information on slug management and strawberries, North Carolina State Extension has a really nice article called Slugs and Strawberries um, that I recommend. It has a nice overview on this. Moving on to sap beetles, there are multiple species of sap beetles in our area that will feed on strawberries. Um, the strawberry sap beetle and the dusky sap beetle are the ones that are of most concern because the four spotted sap beetle likes really overripe fruit. So while you'll sometimes find this, it's not usually as much of a primary pest as the strawberry and the dusky sap beetles are. In terms of the sap beetle life cycle, sap beetles actually overwinter as adults and they do not overwinter within strawberry fields. They actually overwinter in the woods and they've also been found overwintering underneath raspberries and underneath blueberry plants. Um, so they're in the soil, out in the woods, or in other types of fruit. But in the spring, they're coming from other places into your strawberry field. They come into your strawberry field and then they lay their eggs either into the fruit, underneath the fruit, or in the soil, and then the larvae tunnel into the fruit. So here you can see a larva, um, and you may see, if you're trying to identify whether it's sap beetles, the larva has this brown head capsule. And here are some larvae in those, that fruit. The larvae then develop within the fruit, they leave the fruit for the soil, they pupate, they become adults, and they move off to other hosts. Sap beetles actually have a lot of different hosts. They feed on a lot of fruits and vegetables. Things like here you can see sap beetle larvae in sweet corn. Um, they'll feed in tomatoes, feed in raspberries and blueberries. Um, so there's a lot of, especially if you have a diversified farm and a pick your own farm, there's a lot of habitat out there for them on your farm so the populations can build up. In terms of the damage, as I mentioned, both the adults and the larvae directly feed on, on ripe to overripe strawberry fruit. It's unusual to see them in anything before a red strawberry, sometimes a pinkish strawberry. Um, they do prefer, strongly prefer ripe fruit and they're really attracted to fermented fruit, so they like overripe fruit. And here you can see the hole from the, the beetle feeding and getting underneath. And again, here are those larvae feeding in this hole and causing it all to rot. They will also enter fruit that was already damaged. So they're not always the primary problem. Um, they'll go into bird damage, they'll go into slug damage, and they'll go into water damage or cracks and crevices for other re that are, were happen splits that happened for other reasons. Um, and they, again, they can introduce pathogens and they like fermenting fruit. So here you can see where the sap beetle's leaving there's a little bit of starting of some mold and other problems. <clears throat> As I mentioned with their biology, they're, being, they're attracted into strawberries from wherever they overwintered by a nice fermenting fruit odor. They're, they like the smell of fermenting berries. Um, so in terms of cultural management, one of the things that you can do is try to plant your strawberries as far away as possible from woods, blueberries, raspberries, other hosts so that they uh, have to travel further to find your strawberries. And again, with that fermenting berries being a problem, it's really important that you harvest frequently and keep plantings clean, because usually they're coming to that overripe fruit first and then starting a population in your field. Um, so, and that's not just the strawberry plantings you want to keep clean, because if you are growing a diversified, uh, on a diversified situation, these other plantings, melons and things, can build up the population in the fall, so you'll have a lot nearby going into overwintering um, if you have a lot of fruit out there for them to develop in. A secondary part of, of harvesting and keeping your plots clean is renovating as soon as possible. 
Um, and it's not just your strawberries that you want to renovate as soon as possible. Although with the strawberries, if, you, if you're tilling it and renovating it as soon as possible, you can maybe knock some of those pupae down from within the soil. Um, but anything that you can do to keep there from being overripe fruit on your farm, renovating your other fruit crops, burying that overripe fruit is helpful. One of the reasons we see so much problems in matted row is because they like to feed in fruit where it, that touches the ground. So you'll often find them, the fruit looks great, and then they're underneath when you flip it over and they start running out, right? So they like to feed where it touches the ground, and a heavy mulch layer encourages their buildup, both because there's not lots of nice fruit touching the ground, but also because in plastic culture, that fruit actually warms up because it's touching that dark plastic mulch. And so while there might be some in there, they don't necessarily make it to adulthood because the fruit is so hot. So it's less favorable for them to be trying to live in fruit that's touching black plastic than fruit that's touching straw mulch. In terms of biological control, there is a parasitic wasp that lays its eggs in the larvae um, that's out and about and helping us. Um, you cannot buy it. It's just kind of knocking them back as much as it can. Um, and nematodes possibly could help. Cyanoderma carpocapsi is actually commercially available. It's a product called Capsinem. Um, it's been thought that it might help with the larvae and the pupae, especially when they're in the soil. Um, but it hasn't been tested in our area, so I don't know how well it works. But there are some natural enemies out there. In terms of chemical controls, insecticides are really only necessary on farms where the cultural controls aren't working. You're not able to do them. So things like you pick orchards where you just can't get all of the fruit out of the fields. Um, that's typically the situation where you see needing to use chemical controls. And cultural controls really are the best thing we have for controlling sap beetles because it's really hard to get to beetles that are in, and larvae that are inside the fruit. They're in a nice sheltered protected area. This little hole is actually a big sunken cavity, but you see it's not really that much exposure for this beetle if it was inside that hole if you're trying to spray it. For areas that do sometimes have problems with sap beetles, seven day spray intervals are recommended, again, because it's very difficult to get to these beetles and larvae. So North Carolina and Florida both recommend seven day spray intervals for sap beetles. Um, and we have multiple modes of action that work. So it's really important with insecticides, when you're targeting an insect on seven day spray intervals, you wanna use a different mode of action every time as much as possible because that helps reduce the chances that the insect is gonna develop resistant to that, resistance to that product. Uh, in terms of products, again, the pyrethroids and the pyrethrins will work, Brigade and Danitol. Pyganic is an organically approved option, but if you are growing organic, Nemix and Trilogy, Products that have azadiractin or neem oil actually work a little bit better than Pyganic, but Pyganic is a good rotational partner. Um, the benzyl ureas Ryman works really well, but it only works on larvae, and I'll get to that in a moment. Neonics, like a sale, again, they're systemic, so they actually have pretty good, good efficacy for sap beetles and get a little bit into the fruit for those larvae and adults. Um, and the organophosphates, diazinon, dibrome, um, are, are good for, for sap beetles. And we do also have one carbamate seven that will work. One thing about Danitol um, is that it, you can protect fruit just before the sap beetles come in. So remember, they're coming in from outside. Danitol has a little bit of resi residual activity, so it can pr protect the fruit just before first harvest. Again, they're not going to come in until you have red fruit, so you don't want to do this too far in advance of harvest. But if you consistently have a problem with sap beetles, you might want to try um, Danitol right as you're right before your first harvest, like three or four days before first harvest. Um, Ryman works really well, but it only targets larvae. Um, it actually blocks their ability to make their exoskeleton, so they have to be developing for it to work. Um, so you wanna spray as soon as adults are, far, are found. You can't spray in advance because you need, you're basically already spraying in advance when you're picking when adults are found because you're waiting for those larvae to hatch, right? Um, in Florida, when they did various sap beetle spray programs, the program worked best if Ryman was included in the rotation somewhere. Um, so Ryman is really a really good product for sap beetles. 
if you'd like some more information, I really like the University of Florida Extension article. Um, it's titled Sap Beetle Management in Strawberries. It has a lot, a uh, very extensive list uh, of control measures. And then the Mid-Atlantic Berry Guide also has a nice write-up for most of these insects that I discussed. Obviously, the spotted lantern fly is brand new, so it does not have a spotted lantern fly yet. Um, but many of the things I've talked about have a little write-up in there. And I think Mike has an example of the berry guide up here if you want to check it out. In terms of getting my contact info, information about my current research, news articles and fact sheets, that's all available at hambylab.weebly.com. So you can get more information there. Then I've left some time for questions. Yes. What's the best method of control? We don't know. They haven't got to the point of trying to figure out controls. Um, they were hoping that we could quarantine and eradicate this pest. That's looking less and less likely. Um, and recently there was some funds released to start looking at what would be management strategies. Am I looking at a standard peripheroid or, uh, I mean, as far as that, I mean, will it control at all? Do you have any experience with it? We have, we have no idea. People haven't, they have, um, there's nothing registered for spotted and lantern fly. Um, there are people that are doing some laboratory tests. Often with these types of pests, it tends to be systemic insecticides that work best, but we don't know. And we're not recommending control, we're recommending, we're hoping to find it soon enough that we can just get rid of it before it establishes here.